Hello. Um, so as discussed previously, so I, I want to use the last three um, sessions. Thanks. Uh, the last three sessions before Christmas um, to introduce um, Markov decision problems um, as, in my opinion, um, very important and also um, very current um, modeling framework for decision neuroscience. So um, the um, before, um, yeah, I want to talk about in detail what what this is i try to give it some motivation um, so what uh, mark of decision problems which i will most of the time um, call mdps um, what they really provide is um, a language um, a formal language for decisions under uncertainty so it's um, that's uh, i think the biggest uh, um, the biggest contribution they make to um, the endeavor of understanding how the brain makes decisions so if you want to do uh, science especially well, any kind of science, but uh, of course also for the case of neuroscience and then also decision neuroscience, um, you want a quantitative description of what's uh, uh, going on, of what you're studying. And um, if you don't have this quantitative language, this formal language, then it's really hard to study um, the phenomenon you're interested in. And um, uh, Markov decision uh, problems, which actually originate from um, the um, actually the optimization uh, literature and the question of uh, how um, yeah for example companies uh, can um, make the highest uh, um, gain they really provide um, this uh, formal language and this is just um, this is just very helpful and can uh, readily be um, applied to the kind of um, decision problems and uncertainty in real life that we are interested in in modeling um, in decision neuroscience. Um, one other thing that MDPs allow is um, to derive optimal solutions um, for decision problems and uncertainty. And um, this, um, you um, the way I see it is that this provides um, uh, what I call a normative yardstick uh, of what um, yeah, participants or humans, um, um, humans in general or participants in experiments should do in a given um, 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 decision problem under uncertainty. And um, of course, and we discussed that also last time, there is not necessarily um, it's not necessarily the case that humans actually behave optimally, um, but uh, what what um, this offers is also kind of uh, um, a good way of thinking about different kinds of optimality in the sense of uh, if you think from an evolutionary perspective, somehow humans are good, so they can survive and they can mate and reproduce, so they are good at something. Um, and um, if you have um, a framework that can formally describe how, uh, what, what good means, um, then you have a chance to, um, yeah, uh, gain some insight into what's going on. And then the last thing, uh, maybe I don't know what, whether the order is the best, but um, it's a very general framework um, which um, actually. Um, um, allows to um, also uh, subgroup um, um, very spe specific cases where actually the Markov or, or the sequential nature is actually not interesting at all. Uh, finally, it, it can also be uh, extended um, to what is known as partially observable Uh, MDPs, and uh, while this, what I've uh, shown here, 
um, or what I discussed here, this applies to economic, what we called in previous sessions economic uh, choice. Um, the introduction of something that is partially observable, so where the decision maker doesn't have uh, access to what is actually uh, going on out there in the world, but only indirect access, um, that um, allows to also um, yeah, build in a notion of perceptual inference, where you actually have to, uh, from um, indirect readings of the world, um, um, yeah, uh, make decisions and um, especially the partially observable uh, Markov decision processes, um, they really provide a, a framework for integrating um, economic choice um, and perceptual, also uh, economic decision making and perceptual decision making. So um, the problem with um, the, this, I mean, I'm just telling you that it's great right now, and I can tell you so far what, uh, what anything of this is. Um, but the problem um, is, in a way, that if you um, think, if you agree and you think that partially observable Markov decision pro uh, process, processes or problems are a useful way to address problems in decision neuroscience, um, they um, they built, of course, on the Markov decision problem or process uh, framework. And um, I, from my own reading, um, yeah, find it, found it quite hard to really get into a, a partially observable Markov decision process without understanding uh, Markov decision uh, problems or processes first. Um, so um, this is, uh, fr from the mathematics involved, it's actually not that uh, complex uh, so um, it's everything is discrete and um, and you basically just need f uh, uh, some knowledge about functions but what makes things complex in my opinion is that um, you have um, that the notation is, is, is uh, tricky and you have to really uh, um, yeah try hard to uh, understand what's going on um, although the mathematics themselves are not not hard so it's it's more a notational uh, problem so um, what I want to do now uh, in the last uh, three sessions before Christmas is um, discuss MDPs um, and um, they are also in terms of the presentations that you will get uh, that we, we will have in, in January um, they also feature in, in at least one presentation directly, so they um, feature in this advanced reinforcement learning um, uh, framework that um, I think Lilla will uh, present, and um, together. Oh, you two together, and um, they also form um, the basis for. Um, um, reinforcement learning and there's a lot of reinforcement learning um, so they the reinforcement learning and uh, Markov decision uh, problems they are not the same thing so um, reinforcement learning algorithms were um, developed independently of the Markov decision problem uh, literature but um, there has been a lot of crosstalk um, since the I don't know, 60s, 70s, um, between, now maybe a little bit later, 70s, 80s, um, between these, um, 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 yeah, basically mathematical or technical fields. And um, of course, reinforcement learning is very big in decision neuroscience. So um, that's uh, how all these things, uh, um, yeah, come together. So, yeah. But how can reinforcement learning algorithms operate if the environment is not defined in terms of MDPs? Or they use similar annotations, so they also have space? And yeah, but, but, but you. Yeah, yeah, but you, yeah. Um, I mean, that's a little bit, it's a good question, but it's a little bit uh, detailed. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, you don't need to formulate. So, what I mean by that is, first of all, you don't have to formulate or uh, cast a problem as an MDP if you want to do reinforcement learning, as everybody does. And the other thing is that also, the one when, when I think about uh, MDPs, what I also have in mind, as will become clear. Um, is the notion uh, or the concepts of Bellman equation and um, dynamic programming. And of course, uh, um, reinforcement learning algorithms were later shown that they uh, do something uh, sensible with regards to these concepts. But um, 
um, um, they were in the early development were without actually showing this. But let's uh, stop this general talk now because I think it will not say much to anyone uh, besides the people who actually deal with uh, that. So um, let's just get started so that um, um, yeah everybody knows what what's actually uh, going on and what we're talking about. So all of this um, will be um, um, will be based on actually a very very good uh, lecture sc uh, script by uh, Schild. Um, I think it's twenty seven. Um, it's from the University of Marburg. And it's in German. It's in German. Um, but uh, I'm obviously uh, translating it and these are my notes and uh, um, well if they are done I can share them um, so um, this is what I'm actually uh, um, yeah, as just today and um, so um, yeah so once I have made some more corrections of course I will also share the uh, English uh, uh, version yeah so this is um, what everything is built on, so it's not my uh, uh, original uh, work. But I, I think this what what I really like about these notes is that they are really really explicit because a lot of the problems with uh, talking about these models is that the, that they at one point are not explicit enough to actually understand what's going on. Bertzikas is also um, so Bertzikas um, and dynamic uh, optimization is also a very good uh, a book, but um, is from from what I wanted to do a little bit. Uh, too big or too long. Good. So let's uh, go. And the first thing that uh, I want to actually introduce are two examples, um, because I want to, uh, yeah, basically, yeah, set the scope and then and make clear how this actually relates to um, decision neuroscience. So the first thing are um, two examples. And of course, we aim to actually address uh, these examples then um, based on what we learn. The examples, so the first example um, is um, a typical economics example. So bear with me if you don't like that example, the next example you should like. Um, so the first example is um, an example of a company. So there's a company um, and um, the company um, owns a capital stock. So it has some money and um, it um, can um, um, make investments. Um, so um, it can make investments uh, um, over a number of decision or inv investment epochs. Yeah? So that's the um, first thing that is uh, fairly important. So there's something like decision epochs or in this case uh, investment epochs. And these uh, decision epochs are discrete. So um, the company can make um, investments at time points if you want one uh, 0, 1, 2, um, up to a um, fixed number of um, uh, um, time points. So for example, over 100 uh, decision epochs, this company can uh, make some investments. And um, that's already a, a very uh, important thing here. So um, time that we consider here is um, discrete and um, we are looking at a finite uh, time horizon so um, this big t is not infinity um, but it's um, um, this uh, is a finite horizon there are all variations all sorts of variations of the models that we discussed so there of course also there's first of all there's also the uh, time disc uh, continuous uh, framework um, and there's also of course the infinite horizon um, framework so all of these things exist um, but we keep it here at um, the discrete and finite um, case um, now I said the company can make investments and um, the question is what are these investments well um, these are um, yeah these are investments that the company uh, can make 
um, at each of these decision epochs and um, because um, um, we try, I will try to basically use a nomenclature that is uh, helpful for decision neuroscience. I will call these investments um, A0 um, A A1 uh, up to A T. Yeah. So at each um, decision e uh, epoch, the company can make an investment. So invest a, a certain sum of money, a, a zero, a one, a two, a T. And um, that's uh, great. Now the question is, of course, uh, what happens and why is uh, what was the problem and so on. So um, the first thing is um, that um, based on the, so the two things. The first thing is that uh, if the company makes an investment um, and um, at a given uh, epoch, then it gets at the next uh, epoch, it gets the whole investment and um, what it had as capital stock at the current time. So these capital stocks I will call S0, S1, um, to ST. And um, what, um, what happens in this uh, example is that um, the capital stock at uh, uh, decision epoch T plus 1 um, is the same as the capital stock at uh, uh, time ST plus uh, at, at, at time T, the capital stock at time T plus the investment. What this means really clearly is that Let's say the company owns 1,000 euros, so it's not a, it's just a startup or something. And then they decide, okay, we invest uh, 200 euros um, now in um, new computers because then we can make better programs or something. And um, this example describes the situation that these investments are always great and you actually get uh, the money that you invest um, at the next uh, epoch. So um, because you made this investment, investments help you in getting more money. Uh, you have at the next um, um, decision epoch, you have uh, 1,200 uh, um, euros. Yeah? So that's these investments are great. One thing that is already very important here is uh, this notion of um, um yeah sequences and um uh, transitions so um that's also uh, always the case for um mark of decision processes so there's somehow what's going on now influences the future and this of course for decision neuroscience that's very uh, very important because um you um of course humans uh, have somehow the capability to well, at least most of them, no, everyone, uh, to think of how your current action influences um, your uh, future. Yeah. So it's it's all. Um, so basically, uh, human decision making is of course driven by. Um, yeah, thinking about okay, if I behave like this now, what will happen to me in the future? Right. Um, and this is uh, uh, captured um, in these kind of transitions. We will make it much more general later, but uh, here there's this kind of um, uh, from one time step to the next um, transition already. Yeah. The investment is a gain from an investment? No, um, no, no. Um, yeah. Let me uh, finish and then uh, you will uh, see. So the. Um, the other thing is that um, this, um, so what, what this describes so far is just um, an evolution of um, capital stocks. Um, what um, is um, also important is that um, what the company actually um, wants and that of course an investment also um, um, yeah, is costly in some sense. So the um, um, the other thing is that um, the um, net capital, um, that there's something like a net capital stock. At time T, which um, is actually 
um, I will call this R for reasons that will become uh, uh, clear later. Um, so RT is um, the capital stock at time T minus the investment um, at time T um, squared. Yeah. Um, don't try, so I'm trying to make it intuitive, but don't try too deeply to understand how this is uh, related to an actual company. So, uh, because it's a, it's, of course, it's an, it's an example that's extremely simple in order to uh, allow or to introduce um, the, the framework. Yeah. What this means intuitively with the net capital stock is that, okay, the, uh, in, uh, investment, uh, there's a capital stock. And if you make an investment of a certain amount, of course, this is reduced from, um, your um, current capital stock and in, in fact actually the um, if you want to make an investment that where you get the full return on the next uh, stuff you actually have to um, um, pay so then you try to uh, deal with the investment of course one could it also do it differently that the investment is directly 18 then we won't have a, a, a square root here but um, so it's it's you have some reduction um, which is given by uh, at square and on the next uh, time point you get actually at back yeah so it's not as as quite as great as i explained uh, previously for this 1000 uh, versus 1200 uh, uh, case yeah um now what the company wants um is actually to um maximize the net capital stock yeah so the company knows it has uh, the company knows it has some capital stock and it uh, can make some investments and it gets back uh, some uh, of the investment and what it wants to maximize is um, the sum over all these rts yeah so um essentially um, which is of course just uh, R0 plus R1 plus RT. Yeah. So this is what the company wants to do. Um, so it wants to uh, yeah, get the most in this little game of where, um, where the dynamics of the problem are governed by um, this and by this um, as you if you're a little bit familiar with the whole thing um, might notice is that there is uh, no probability whatsoever in, involved so that it is not uncertain what happens at the next step it's not uncertain um, what happens to the um, capital stock and what the net capital stock is and so on so every there's nothing there's no uh, probability in this example at all um, but that is good because it allows to actually um, focus, um, if, uh, if one looks at the solution for this example, to focus on the um, really the, um, yeah, the fundamental ideas. Um, you might not like that example too much because it's uh, fairly contrived. It really helps to introduce the whole thing. Um, but I hope you like the uh, second example that um, I will now um, tell you about and you might even um, notice that this relates to some of the research that you've been re reading about in decision neuroscience and the second example um, is um, a gambler and um, the gambler um, also can uh, make decisions over um, uh, decision epochs one to zero one two um, t and um, at each of these decision epochs the gambler uh, essentially like the co uh, company uh, owns an amount of uh, money xt um, which is always larger than uh, zero. So if it gets negative, the, the whole thing stops and it's it's not in the example. So this will be uh, important later. Again, it's of course, it's an example. It's, it's a little bit contrived, but it's closer to actually the experiments that you see in decision neuroscience. 
Of course, you could also already make an, uh, make an experiment from what we just discussed. Now, um, what the gambler can do at each decision epoch, um, so that's the uh, money that the gambler has at decision epoch t. Um, what the gambler can do on each decision epoch is to um, invest a fraction of that, um, which we, um, of that money, um, but which is now, um, let's do it like this, make it clearer, um, which is uh, between uh, zero and one, um, invest this in a bet. Yeah? So essentially, uh, the situation is like as follows. So you are the gambler, you have 20 euros, and um, now you can, um, at, uh, at a given um, epoch of the game, you can invest uh, into a bet, but you can what you can invest is actually um, a percentage of your 20 euros. So for example, um, 90%. So you invest 18 uh, euros into a bet or you decide, okay, 50%, so then it would be 10 euros. Now, what is the bet? Um, the bet um, is uh, a binary outcome bet. And um, what um, there are two outcomes, so that's this binary, so there are two outcomes of the bet. And um, the uh, outcome is win for the gambler and lose. And if the gambler wins, uh, and actually the gambler wins with probability larger than 0 0.5, so it's actually a good uh, thing. But of course, the gambler can also be really unlucky. And uh, although there is an 80% chance of getting the CSC, you don't get it. Um, the probability um, to lose is then, of course, uh, um, 1 minus p, and this is smaller than 0 0.5. Now, what happens uh, to the money and the fraction of the bet? Well, the uh, good news is that um, if the gambler wins, um, the um, money that the gambler has at the next time step is um, his or her um, um, money before plus the um, fraction that he or she invested. If she loses, then the money at the next uh, point is, of course, unfortunately, um, the uh, reduction of this. Yeah. So this is all, almost like a real um, decision neuroscience um, um, economic choice experiment where um, on each trial of the task, uh, participants are asked to uh, choose uh, like a fraction of uh, what, they, uh, what they want to bet. And then there's uh, kind of um, a coin is thrown, or I mean, similar to the computer, of course. And at the next uh, time point, they uh, get, if they win, they get um, um, the, so for example, if they had uh, uh, said, okay, I invest 10%, uh, then um, they start at 20, they have at the next time, they have 22. And if they lose, they and then on the next time have 80. So that's like a typical, really like a typical um, economic choice uh, decision neuroscience um, experiment, I would say. And of course, it um, um, models for real world applications. It, it models uh, um, situations where, um, yeah, you have to make a decision on, on what to do. So in this case, uh, the decision to choose um, what what kind of fraction you want to invest. And then what you actually have after that is, uh, um, um, yeah, is determined by by something that is uncertain, so um, which is modeled here by this uh, outcome bet. Furthermore, one thing that I haven't uh, discussed yet is that um, in this example, which we actually not start uh, today, 
but um, once we went through the other example, um, what is also invoked is a utility function. So remember that we discussed in utility functions uh, all the time, uh, discussed a lot about uh, utility functions and what the gambler actually wants. Uh, this was kind of implicit. Um, I didn't actually mention it, but what the um, um, gambler wants is, of course, to maximize uh, the uh, money uh, she holds at um, the final um, uh, sorry time point um but um what we also what was also uh, built in uh, to that is actually um, to account for the fact that uh, different gamblers might have different uh, utilities from um, uh, ordinal amount of money. So actually what um, is to be maximized is the subjective utility. So there's a utility function of the final money. Yeah. So that's, and that's the utility function. U. Utility function. Um, and we will actually use um, later on the uh, logarithm as a utility function, but of course you can def uh, use different uh, utility functions. Yeah. So that's the second example. And um, as you uh, might also notice here, there's again, there's this notion of uh, transition. Um, there is um, a notion of uh, what is to be um, maximized. And in this case, actually, there's a probability in there. Yeah. But to understand the whole thing, it's really helpful, even if you think this is a little bit contrived, or at least I think it's a little bit contrived, um, to discuss first the case where there's no probability. Yeah. Questions about the examples? No. Good. So then, now the um so what we then now want to um talk about or i want to talk about is um um the first of all a general framework to describe these kind of examples and then of course um, the solution um, theory yeah so these were now two examples and the next thing is uh, first to um, yeah, basically um, yeah, cast this more generally um, and uh, introduce kind of the notion of a Markov decision problem, which because we will use the first example is a little bit weird because we're not talking about probabilistic uh, concepts and Markov, the term Markov is really a term that is uh, uh, familiar from probability theory, but um, it, it makes sense. And of course you can always uh, um, um, interpret um, deterministic things as uh, things like with a probability of one. So um, Markov decision uh, problem, um, um, slash process, and I will make the difference clear, um, is now the next thing. And this is really what I meant by um, um, it, that this, the idea of uh, Markov decision processes um, provides a language to think about uh, uh, things that you have in these uh, real life and any kind of decisions under uncertainty, which are sequential, but of course also the sequential, you've seen that there was this transition and so on, but of course also if you make a one-time um, decision, like the lottery choices that we talked about, of course um, that's only a very special case of the sequential um, scenario where you, where you actually don't only have one decision epoch. So this is also, um, this is the general uh, framework nature that um, I really like about um, Markov decision uh, problem and processes for um, decision neuroscience. Now, um, the first, so, yeah, so the next thing is to actually define what I here call um, um, uh, deterministic, it doesn't really exist, I made this up, but it's, uh, um, I mean, it exists now. Uh, dep there's actually some philosophy on this that thinks that people talk about they exist in some sense, like unicorns. Um, deterministic uh, Markov uh, decision process, also I can really call it deterministic MDP. And one thing that is important for those who have seen more, it's a time invariant. So um, the crucial functions don't uh, change. 
Now, what do I mean by a deterministic Markov decision process? Um, actually, I mean something that I always call a tuple. And if you wonder what a tuple is, it's just um, a collection collection of things. It has no further meaning uh, than uh, than that you say, okay, look, there's a tuple. And the tuple, uh, this is the tuple, um, which uh, I now call the deterministic mark of decision uh, process. And the tuple, of course, has uh, some components, T, S, R, R. Uh, and then the small s, r, uh, r, and f, and g. And um, wh wh why I think this is so important uh, to cast things in terms of Markov, uh, or to at least define these tuples, is because they really should allow you to yeah, introduce and think about all the situations that are important in an experimental situation. And if you think about uh, modeling with your experimental situation in decision neuroscience model, a real world context, then they provide the scope that, of things that you need to think about. And um, that's good because then you know that it really structures your thinking. So what are these components now of this tuple? Um, so T, is just a natural number. Um, so that's how I denote that. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's, for example, something like t equals 4. Yeah. Um, so that is um, what this describes is the time horizon or the number of decision epochs. Yeah. So, for example, the gambler uh, does this game of chance for 10 uh, decision epochs, for 10 times he can choose what kind of fraction he wants to invest, or she, uh, then um, uh, t equals 10. Uh, so it's really nothing more than a, a number, a, a number, like a discrete number. <laughs> um, yeah. What is s then? S um, is what I would call the uh, state space. Sounds fancy, um, but um, doesn't mean too much. Um, it means S is a, a set, a set of numbers, because we're doing quantitative things here. And um, the um, um, and describes all the values that these S can take on. So to go back to the examples, um, the company had this capital stock. So um, this, these S's were the uh, capital stocks. Um, the, the gambler had the amount of money that he, he holds. So that were these uh, XT's. And of course, these um, uh, quantities can take on specific values. And uh, if you want to formalize things, it's uh, helpful if you actually specify what kind of values uh, they can take on. Specifically, whether it's just uh, numbers or it's maybe collections of numbers um, or whatever. So in the case of the um, uh, company example, this was the capital stock. So a sensible thing to use there is uh, the real numbers so that you allow for decimals so that your capital stock can, for example, be uh, 10 euro, uh, 10.4 euros. Yeah? But that's it. Um, so it cannot be a collection of numbers or something. So it's just uh, a real number. That's the um, states, so-called state space. Um, A is what I call uh, the action space. And um, this is also, you can also call that, um, yeah, these are the values that the decisions can take on. Again, we want to quantify things. So for example, if you have only uh, like two options in a, some kind of decision problem, then of course your two options you can describe by zero and one. Um, in the examples that we actually looked at, um, so for the company, they had uh, these investments, AT, so they could actually um, choose um, um, real numbers. So that was the uh, example for the company. So that's uh, again for the company example. Um, 
and um, the gambler had different kind of actions available. He needed to invest a fraction, so a number between zero and one. Now, R is what I call the reward space, and hence R. So these are the things that when summed over all these decision epochs, um, the um, gambler actually wants to, um, and not the gambler, sorry, the decision maker actually wants to maximize. And um, again, these are, um, for example, in the case of the company, these were these net, um, these were these net uh, capital stocks where um, you get something from your investment uh, based on your T minus one investment, but you also uh, subtract something. Um, so again, because here um, in this case, these were numbers. So the uh, stock was like 10.5, the uh, investment was like five. Then the reward space again is just a, uh, uh, sorry, the reward space is again, just a sensibly a real number. Yeah, just basically defines the scope of things that you are dealing with and you want to think about. Now, um, what are these S0 to T? Well, this, um, what I mean by this uh, colon notation is that it's the collection of S0, S1, um, to ST. So this for the company, this were the capital stocks and um, they um, are usually referred to as state variables, so in the general setting, state variables. Um, they, in the standard, um, in the standard Markov decision uh, problem process uh, theory, these are actually random variables. Um, in what we are looking at um, currently, it's not a random variable, but it's just a variable like you know from school, where you have something like, uh, uh, 2x equals 1 and then you call this a variable um, and you can um, solve uh, for x so we get uh, x equals 1 half and so these kind of variables yeah so you know what variables are and of course here the um, variables and this is the uh, thing with this state space these variables um, are always in the state space which just means that for the company example uh, these uh, states are just real numbers are just um, uh, the capital stock at a given time the same exactly the same logic for a zero uh, t and r zero uh, to t so again this is the collection of um, actions and all are real numbers. I'll write it out. Um, and uh, that's about it. Uh, for those, um, the um, most important, well, in the really, what, what really defines, so this is kind of like a uh, um, this is kind of a overhead that helps to structure thinking, but uh, doesn't really do much. Um, so it just is there and it's defined and we know what we talk about. Um, the action really is in this F and G. And what is that? So for the Markov, um, for the deterministic Markov decision processes, the F is, um, the so-called transition function and um, what this does is that it uh, depending on actions chosen and current states it gives you the next state yeah so f is a function that takes in a state so this is the set of states and an action and um, let me have a look how I do it exactly. And it returns a state. So more explicitly, it takes in state uh, at uh, time t, action at time t, and maps this onto 
the value that this function takes at S, um, um, for these values and this is um, actually supposed to be the state at t plus 1. Yeah. So we actually have seen an example for such a function here. So here the function f takes the state at, um, so the capital stock at uh, time t, s t, and the action at uh, time t, so the investment, and returns the um, state, so the capital stock at time t plus 1, and it's given by the sum of um, these two. Yeah. So in the notation, which is essentially the same notation here, um, we would have for the company s t a t is defined as st plus at. Yeah, that's a function, st plus at. I'm always looking down here and now looking up and I see that you're still looking at the screen. That is good. Um, good. Um, the final thing, um, and the final thing is the, um, uh, the function g which um, is um, what I call the reward function. And of course I call it reward function um, because uh, I'm thinking of decision neuroscience experiments where people get a reward. Yeah? Um, and um, and also, yeah, in terms of all these um, biological ideas, you get a reward and then get reinforced and, and so on. So this is why I'm talking about uh, rewards and not something uh, else or losses, uh, not losses or something, but you get some rewards and you want rewards. Um, and um, the reward function actually um, for this, uh, for the deterministic market decision process that we are currently talking about, um, takes um, also a state, an action, and returns a value in the reward set. So um, basically, it looks like this. So like the transition function, it takes on and the, and the state variable and the action variable at time t, and returns. Um, what is known as the reward at time t. And um, also for the company, we have seen what that is. So I'm not uh, scrolling up uh, <coughs> again. Um, so that's again for the company. For the company, this reward was the, um, the capital stock at time t minus the investment to the square. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's the um, reward um, function for the company and in general the reward function. So now if you are thinking about um, a certain experiment that you read about in your, um, in your in the preparation of your um, uh, presentations or you think about of uh, how to make a career in science or something, it helps to first think about what is actually the state space um, what are uh, the rewards that can be governed? Um, what uh, um, what uh, do I, um, yeah, uh, assuming that you want to maximize uh, the, the sum to rewards, um, and um, how many uh, trials, do I, um, trials do I have on CSC proposals? Maybe just one in your lifetime. Anyway, and um, how, where does a certain state and a certain action that I take uh, take me? Yeah. So it's a little bit self indulgent, the whole thing, but I need this now. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's a, a deterministic mark of decision process. And this is, uh, so that's uh, the. Uh, deterministic Markov decision process. So far, there's actually not a problem. It's just a lot of things. And if you uh, think of uh, doing simulations on a computer, you, of course, if you begin with some 
uh, value s and you as uh, s uh, zero and you assume that uh, you have um, you know or you just make up some uh, values for a t then you can look at how this thing evolves questions right now about this no do you want me to keep going until uh, 5 30 or do you want to have a break who wants a break Everybody wants me to go away. Keep, um, keep going. Okay, then I can go. The earlier you can go. So now, what is actually the problem here, and um, what is the um, what is the difference between a Markov decision process and a Markov decision problem? Well, um, the um, so far, we have just specified a, a, a big thing of things, so this tuple, um, but we haven't really stated uh, what a decision maker would want to do. And this now, there you have to actually, um, um, there you can go down two uh, routes in terms of um, behavioral models and thinking about decision neuroscience. So you can either say, okay, that's it. Um, now I know what my problem scope is. And um, yeah, so um, there might be a decision maker who can take these actions and gets rewards, but um, yeah, I don't care what actually, uh, whatever. So I think the decision maker just takes actions. For example, the scambler, the decision maker just takes the action to always invest 0 0.5. It just happens. Um, and that's then you have also a quantitative model of what's going on. Um, the question is how you justify this model, but you might not even want to justify your model. So that's fine. The other way you can go down is to actually um, um, think or look closer into what actually Markov decision problem uh, theory offers in terms of um, things that are normatively sensible. So from a, a from the perspective of what one should do, um, and the standard uh, um, uh, thing maybe I um, make a new headline. Uh, so Markov decision problem again here right now deterministic. The standard thing. Um, is the following. So you have um, a, Markov, um, a Markov decision process. So you have defined this T, S, R, um, R. Um, you know about your variables. Um, you know um, and uh, T and you know about your function. So you have to define the whole thing. And now you postulate the uh, problem that a decision maker actually wants to uh, maximize um, the cumulative sum of rewards or just the sum of rewards. So the sum of rewards, so at each decision epoch, the um, decision A agent gets a reward RT and then over all decision epochs, um, the cumulative sum or the sum is just um, the sum of these RTs. So uh, let's say um, the invest the, 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 the company um, the company makes uh, uh, gets this uh, um, gets R one like uh, equals I don't know three euros so that's the capital stock minus the squared investment uh, two gets uh, ten uh, uh, euros and R three gets um, four euros, then the cumulative sum is uh, 17, right? And now what the company obviously uh, wants to do, or this is at least the reasoning uh, in the Markov decision process uh, uh, literature, is to maximize this sum. And of course, the sum, the reward that it gets is dependent on the actions it chooses. Yeah. So somehow the actions uh, play a role um, for the rewards. So um, what, um, yeah, 
what the this this is the this is a fundamental assumption in the whole thing that the decision agent actually wants to maximize the uh, sum to reward and you can of course uh, say um no but i think from from an evolution you need to give gifts uh, from my perspective you need to give some constraints to the decisions that humans do so if you don't want to assume that in their decisions, uh, humans want to achieve something. Um, well, then everything is random, and then there's no point in talking about decision making at all, right? So one has to make this assumption, I think. Or does anyone see a way of not assuming that when humans make decisions, they want to do something? Because that's the only thing that this has. What the exact rewards are, this is of course can be completely different. So uh, the, the rewards can of course be money, but uh, it can also be, uh, for example, if you're thinking about experiments, um, you can also of course describe here the case that the um, people want to get out as uh, soon as possible. So either so that you don't know, but uh, these are two possible options. So your decision to say we don't have a break. Uh, well can be because you really want to continue uh, uh, learning that's one way or you because you want to go home earlier that's another way but in both cases um, we assume that there was at least i assume that there was something motivating your uh, decision and this is just the sum of rewards yeah so um, uh, we're assuming that the aim is to optimize the certain process and that can be achieved either by maximizing some value or minimizing some value um yeah that's a different issue so the um the um you you don't want to um actually um uh, maximize a process you just want to maximize a sum of values I know that's and what I said. I said you want to optimize the process. No, you don't want to optimize a process. You want to optimize because the process is uh, this tuple. What you want to optimize is the sum of um, rewards. And um, of course, you can formulate that either by minimizing losses, but I chose that uh, we want to maximize rewards. But then, of course, you can say that a loss is a negative reward. And then you can say, OK, I want to minimize my um, uh, losses. Or you say, uh, I just want to maximize my rewards. Yeah. Um, now let's uh, express this a little bit more formally, this uh, maximization of uh, um, the cumulative rewards. Because the real uh, problem um, that uh, is there um, for Markov decision problems is the following. One can write it like this. So max just means maximize something, maximize um, the sum of rewards over decision epochs. And if one states it like this with this RT there, it does not really get uh, um, explicit that you actually uh, want to choose your actions such as to maximize your rewards so um, if you remember this there's this reward function which takes a uh, takes a state and an action so if you um, replace the the value that this function takes on rt by the function it gets much clearer that you actually um, want to choose your actions in a way that you maximize some reward so this is just RT. It's just the same thing, just in, expressed in in, uh, in terms of the um, um, function. And you want to maximize it, of course, with re, uh, by choosing um, your actions accordingly. Yeah. So what this notation here just wants to say is, you want to maximize this quantity here which is just um, for the case of uh, um, real numbered rewards, it's just a real number. You want to maximize it with um, uh, by choosing a specific um, sequence of actions. Yeah. So you, you know that you can, for example, the gambler can make 10 um, choices for the fraction you want, she wants to uh, um, invest. And, um, 
the problem is to find the specific sequence of actions that maximize the reward. What will become also uh, clear when we talk a little bit more about it, uh, actually the, um, it's actually even bigger uh, what the, what the MDP um, framework allows. It's actually these actions that will uh, turn out to be good actions, um, are adaptive, uh, um, for specific states. This will, I think I keep that, uh, keep that in mind. It will become clear, uh, hopefully in a second. So somehow the actions, uh, the sequence of actions are to be chosen to maximize the reward. Um, there are two constraints. Um, so this is always then called subject to two things. Um, first of all, that the state at t plus one is given by the transition function. So this is nothing new. It's just restating that there's this transition function and and this is actually not a, um, not a problem, it's rather good, is that um, the initial state, so for example, the initial capital of the company is known. Yeah? So these are, so um, if um, this would be not known, it doesn't need to be, uh, so we will keep a functional dependence on it, but so it, it just, to, to make this a meaningful thing, um, you have to say, okay, we start somewhere. Yeah. You can keep this a variable, but you have to say you know in a specific case, you know um, the variable. So this is actually um, the mark of decision problem. Yeah? To maximize the cumulative sum of rewards over uh, all possible action sequences and um, um, yeah, subject to the transition of the mark of decision uh, process and uh, given that as zero is no. So that's the difference that I make between process and problem. So the process is just the things, the ingredients of the whole thing, and the problem is to maximize a certain quantity. Actually, if you go into the, you can also have different criteria of what you actually want to maximize. And sometimes a very prominent thing is also that you uh, discount um, um, rewards that are further in the future so that you say, okay, um, I want to, um, um, the first reward, I want the full reward, but I don't care about like the tenth reward uh, right now because that's uh, in the future, so I downweight it. So this also exists, but it's not here. So that's uh, temporal discounting is actually not uh, here. Yeah? But one can build it in. So it's, it's, I'm just not doing it because it's simpler. So now the question is, what is actually the solution that we are uh, uh, looking for? And this is now... Um, Everything is really important today, but this is really, really important. Um, so what is actually, what are we actually looking for? And um, this is what is known as decision rules um, and policies. And this is, I think, where a lot of the introduction to Markov decision processes and partially observed Markov processes get it, um, start to get hard to follow because they talk about a lot about policies but not very much about decision rules and then um, it's it's in my opinion quite hard to follow so um because what actually the framework of solving um, mark of decision processes allows is um, to um, obtain decision rules now what are decision rules um So if you think about what's, what's going on uh, there is um, there are these uh, decision epochs like the company uh, knows that there's a certain uh, capital stock or the gambler knows I have that much amount of money. Now I should make a decision. And um, somehow the, um, the overall problem is to find um, for each step of the process to find the action that for a given state um, is optimal in the sense that uh, it will uh, maximize the um, uh, cumulative rewards. So um, for example, so assume maybe just let's just start. So there is, um, um, there is a state uh, S0 um, and um, the, part the participant or the decision maker or the company uh, needs to think about uh, the first um, action. 
Now, um, what is important is that the company or the decision maker should have some rule to uh, make this uh, decision um, based on all possible values that S0 can take on. So that, uh, for example, it, it, and this is also what, what this whole framework allows you to, to get, um, it's not, you don't find an optimal uh, um, decision, um, um, you don't find um, the good way to make decisions only for a very specific value of the initial uh, um, um, capital stock. So for example, only for if you have 1000 euros in the beginning, then you know um, what uh, kind of um, decision to make. But you know, and you get from the framework, you get um, the yeah the best um, decision to make if you want to maximize your cumulative rewards for all possible values that you can have in the beginning. Yeah, so from everything from um, very little amount uh, to a lot of amount. And uh, to formalize this, um, one can uh, express this in um, what I call decision rules. So these are functions that take a state. So like, for example, the initial uh, capital of the company. So that's S0 and return an action. Um, so they, um, so for example, if the, um, the um, initial state is 1000, um, a decision rule could say, okay, um, invest uh, 50. Yeah, so um, S0 is mapped to the value of um, the decision rule. Um, but there's some, there's some, uh, actually, there's a typo in my script, I'm just realizing, um, but you don't see that. So what this means, so this is the decision rule at time zero. That there's a function from, from the possible values that the state can take on into uh, the possible uh, actions that you can take. Yeah. And of course, uh, you can uh, posit uh, such a decision rule, and you must actually, um, another um, um, Markov decision uh, process problem framework for every uh, time step. Yeah. So for every time step, you have um, a rule that tells you if the state, so the capital stock, for example, takes on a specific value, um, what action is appropriate. So far, however, I'm just saying uh, there are decision rules um, and I haven't said uh, that uh, these decision <laughs> rules are actually optimal. If I mean an optimal decision uh, uh, rule that actually um, helps you to um, maximize your cumulative rewards, then I will denote that by a star. So what an optimal decision rule is in, in more detail, I will um, of course, um, oops, um, talk much more about, but uh, just note that um, I think about two things here, namely decision rules, which can be anything. So it can a decision rule can be, yeah, when when the state of for the company is uh, let's say five hundred, and essentially regardless of the state of the company, always invests you. That's a decision rule, um, but uh, it may not be the optimal decision rule. Yeah? The optimal decision rule, um, this is actually what we want to find. And uh, this then um, it gets a new, a little bit of a different notation, namely the star. Now, these are decision rules. So these are functions that for each uh, uh, time epoch and uh, give you um, an action for um, each um, state. Now, of course, um, we had uh, we know that um, these decision epochs go from zero one to big T. So we can also collect these decision rules, which are functions, um, into yeah a tuple if you want um, 
and this tuple is actually called a policy and often gets uh, the letter p for policy and actually maybe in addition this is actually called a markov uh, policy because each of the decision functions only depends on um, the current um, um, state. So you can, especially if you go to partially observable Markov uh, decision processes, then um, you first uh, face the fact that actually your um, decisions um, do not only depend on um, the current state, but some indirect observation of that. So all your previous actions and all your uh, previous um, uh, um, observations. For what we're doing here, we are looking at Markov policies where each uh, decision rule only depends on one um, state. So, um, yeah, but this is, this is if, if you now think about it, um, and uh, spe specifically um, the, the problem that uh, we um, discussed earlier, you want to find... Um, hmm? star. You want to find pi star? But um, pi star is actually um, obviously d0 um, star, uh, d1 star, uh, dt um, star. You want to find that, but what is that? This is actually um, d0 star for um, you need to know that so d0 star is just the function but of course the function is defined in terms of the uh, values that it takes on for uh, all possible input values so you have um, d0 star you have um, um, d uh, and so on um, while i'm doing this will become clear in a second i hope um, because these things are your optimal actions so that's your optimal action um, at time one for a specific uh, um, state um, um, S0. Um, that's your um, optimal uh, action. Optimal action. And this is actually these optimal actions, which um, are dependent on the state, and, but that doesn't quite get, get quite clear if one just writes it like this. So this is why I um, like the other way as well. These are actually the ones that uh, maximize over all actions, maximize your um, summed rewards. Yeah. So what this now means, and this is why I think this is important, is that the problem is actually to find functions. Yeah. So of course you want to find optimal actions, but these optimal actions, um, given the problem setup, depend on the state. So the optimal investment of the company depends on what it current what its current capital stock is. So you want to actually find uh, optimal, uh, you want actually to find functions that map states into actions. And I mean, if you uh, know, um, maybe remember from school how to find the maximum of a function, something like um, um, minus x square or so, where, which uh, looks something like this. And you know that you can uh, find the maximum of this by taking the derivative and then um, setting to zero and then solving and you get uh, find that the maximum is at zero. Um, well, you do that, uh, you, you, you look for a number, right? So you look for a number that uh, maximizes uh, um, this function and the number turns out zero. Here, you actually look for a sequence of functions. So that's really, I find that really hard because you have you're looking for functions, yeah. So you're looking for um, and you, you look for functions for each um, uh, decision epoch. So um, essentially, if you really think about it in abstract terms, um, you can think is there's a there's a space of functions that you have available at each uh, decision epoch. So you have all sorts of rules um, that uh, you could apply in a given case yeah so assume you have that much money um, then you could come with saying okay i will um, if it's about this investment i will invest um, um, the money square or i will invest the, the square root of the 
money that I have, or I will invest uh, always the same thing, or I will invest uh, in the exponential divided by the uh, um, of the money that I have divided by three or so. So you have all these uh, possible functions that you could uh, take, and you and this is only for one uh, time step. And now you have multiple time steps uh, behind each other, so you have. Uh, a product function space and you actually want to maximize over this product function space so this i think um, that this works at all uh, is already quite surprising do you share my enthusiasm <laughs> maybe not, not quite um okay so that's um actually the uh, problem and i haven't uh, talked about at all um how this can be done but it can be done and you will and we will actually uh, calculate this um, for both examples so we will actually um, calculate um, this for the um, problem of the company and we will also calculate that for the problem of the gambler maybe we have to meet on christmas eve but uh, we will definitely compute it for the for the company um Yeah, I think the last thing that I uh, want to do now um, is uh, so 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 far we've just uh, uh, talked about the problem scope. So we said, okay, the problem, the ingredients of the problem are this uh, uh, is this Markov decision process. The problem itself is to maximize um, the cumulative sum of rewards with respect to actions, but. Um, I haven't talked about at all um, how this can be done and of course that's the new next uh, the next thing then how this can be done and this is actually uh, related uh, to two things two very important terms one is Bellman equation or Bellman equations and the other thing is uh, dynamic programming dynamic programming algorithm it's essentially the same thing and I will show you what, what is meant by that um, the um, one thing we need before we uh, actually can talk about Berman equation and dynamic uh, uh, programming and the dynamic programming algorithm is something known as um, um, the um, optimal value function or something known as value functions. Um, this uh, here I want to put this so. So, and I think this is the last thing then uh, to do for today. So um, we need to talk about value functions. Um, or um, yeah, actually optimal value functions because I'm just talking about optimal value functions. And they are also, uh, if you look into decision neuroscience value functions or optimal value functions, is usually not quite clear, are all over the place. If people use reinforcement learning algorithms um, to model experimental data, these reinforcement learning algorithms, they are supposed to approximate the optimal value function. So um, this is really the concept that uh, justifies using reinforcement learning algorithms to find correlations with prediction errors in the striatum. So um, this is really, um, yeah, this is also very important. Everything is important today. Um, so what are these value functions or optimal value functions, I should say? Um, essentially, um, Oh, there's also a typo. Essentially, you already know what uh, value functions uh, are, or at least you've seen one value function, um, namely um, this thing um, here. So this was the um, um, maximum um, over all actions from 0 um, uh, to 10, uh, so to 10, from 0 to t um, of uh, the um, cumulative uh, rewards. Now let me first write down the optimal value function and then explain what's, what's going on there. So um, an optimal value function is um, a function of states which are mapped to real numbers 
and um, is defined as follows. So it takes on a state, so for example, the capital of um, the uh, company that we're interested in, um, and returns the following. It returns the maximum of the cumulative rewards for what is called the remainder problem. over the actions also for the remainder problem. Uh, that's a K, sorry. Ah, that's a V, yeah. V, small V. Um, yeah. So what, what is this? Um, Essentially, it's just uh, the extension of uh, what we've seen uh, previously with respect to the um, um, cumulative rewards. Of course, if you um, um, set um, t, so if you set t to zero, so if you're thinking about the first decision epoch, then um, you here have uh, the maximum over all actions from zero to t um, of these uh, rewards. And um, this is just um, what we've seen, uh, of course, uh, up here. Yeah. So the value function, the optimal value function at time zero, is just um, the the thing that one that um, is to be maximized. That's just the um, maximum of the sum of cumulative rewards. Now, of course, you uh, what happens here is that um, instead of starting at zero one starts at time point t so um, this uh, sorry starts at t and only co uh, is considered with the remainder problem so for example if t uh, the big t is three then of course you can start at zero you can start at one you can start at two and you can also start at uh, um, three and now you can if you are at uh, um, time point uh, um, small t being one, um, you can think about maximizing um, just the cumulative sum of, um, of rewards that are still um, to come. Why this is important, and um, we will see when we talk about Bellman equation, but what I want to stress here is uh, are two things. First of all, value functions exist there's not only one optimal value functions, there is actually a collection of value functions, optimal value functions, namely uh, v1, v2, uh, v0 of course also, and vt. So there are many optimal value functions for a given uh, problem because you can think about starting and considering this uh, uh, maximization over actions for each of the decision epochs. and. Um, value functions are a function of um, states. And this uh, you can view as follows. So um, think about what happens here if you actually do this maximization. So you find an action that is optimal. Then um, you have um, actually here, you have um, found an optimal action. How to do that, that will, uh, will not happen today anymore. Um, you have found an optimal action, but um, the um, which actually might depend on the um, state based on the decision rule, the optimal decision rule. But the whole thing is, um, I think I can remove this tilde I had it for some reason. Um, the um, the whole thing is still dependent on the value of um, the initial state. Ah, yeah, now I see uh, what, what, what I'm missing here. And this is why I still need the tilde. It's getting late. I'm definitely not getting better. Um, the um, thing is like um, the other problem. The assumption is 
that you know the initial value. Yeah. So remember up uh, up there I said uh, s uh, zero is known. And um, also for the optimal value functions, the assumption is that the initial value, so in this case, the initial value is um, the value at t of the state, is known. And um, this um, assumption here um, makes the whole thing a function of the uh, state. So depending on different initial values, s t tilde, um, this is a function because this, uh, the s, um, um, s tilde t factors in here and of course what still applies is that um, s t plus 1 equals f s t a t so we're still in the context of the um, Markov decision problem so these are the two constraints that apply for optimal value functions so the only difference so what what, what is really important about the uh, optimal value functions is the one thing that you start not always at zero but um, at um, going um, uh, signing at each uh, uh, decision epoch so you have a lot of value functions for each um, time point one and um, it's a function of the initial value of this of these remainder um, um, problems so um, yeah it's again uh, functions so i think because i'm losing uh, concentration um, and we have almost 90 one minutes um, so the if you're not in try at zero, but uh, let's say one or two, then you're not assuming that you know this one, right? You only know state zero, no, not later ones, right? If, let, if you're in try 10 and you say, okay, I compute the value function from try 10 to <coughs> 20, then you don't assume that you know 10, right? You only assume you knew zero. No, um, the value function at try 10 yeah. is a function of the possible values of the state at try 10. So, um, so for example, so if you think about the company, um, there's now investment uh, period ten. Mm -hmm. Then um, you assume uh, then the value function at uh, time ten is a function of the possible values that um, the state at time ten can take. Uh -huh. So, and to evaluate what actually the optimal value function is. You assume that um, you basically, yeah, assume that uh, you, you specify a function that takes on all the possible values that uh, the state can be at ten. So make the, okay. let's make this concrete. So you let's say uh, for some reason the state at uh, ten can only be uh, five, ten, and fifteen. Then the optimal value function at uh, uh, um, ten. Um, takes in um, the possible states at, uh, um, at this time um, 10 and um, for each of these possible states it's evaluated based on uh, this and then uh, you of course also need to evaluate it based on this initial state and based on so um, yeah yeah okay good uh, and of course, in, in, in this investment example, these are the real numbers, of course, because it's always the real numbers, and then it's actually, it's, it's, a, lot. it's a lot. Yeah, <laughs> the whole thing is a lot. Um, yeah. But is it like, do you approximate this uh, in the case of real numbers? No, in, in this example, we will actually see how these things look. And um, it actually, because this example is really uh, simple, it actually takes a very specific form and then also quite simple. Okay. Um, but of course, uh, yeah, you can have uh, um, things, making things more complex fairly easy. So, one has, so in terms of designing experiments that you want to model with this, yeah, one take care in a way okay so um uh, i will stop here and um, i think refresh the um, um uh, notion of um, value functions um then in the beginning of the next uh, session and um, but then uh, the next topic is uh, already the bellman equation is necessary and sufficient condition for optimal policies we will actually not prove that the bellman equation uh, is true and that dynamic programming works um, but we will look at the solution and um, use this as an algorithm to compute the optimal um, uh, policies for the examples that we have seen. Yeah. Good. So I hope you had a little bit of fun. I had a lot of fun. Okay.
Let's see.